Welcome everyone. My name is Zach Mallon. I'm the coordinator for the Lower Nahalem Watershed Council. Um, this is a talk co-sponsored between uh, us, the Lower Nahalem Watershed Council and the Friends of Cape Falcon Marine Reserve. Um, and before we get into our speaker tonight, I'm just gonna give you a quick little glimpse into who the Watershed Council is and what we're doing. And then I believe Margaret's gonna do the same and then we'll get into uh, Meg's presentation. So without further ado, I'll, I, there we are, we are recording. That's embarrassing. So yeah, welcome. <laughs> this is us. We, Lower Nahalem Watershed Council is dedicated to the protection, preservation and enhancement of the Nahalem watershed through leadership, cooperation and education. And where we do it is in this area here. We are the big green blob. And as you can see, we are in Clatsop, Tillamook in a little bit of Washington County. Um, the Lower Nehalem Watershed Council covers all the tributaries to the North Fork, as well as all the tributaries to the main stem up to Humbug Creek, um, which also includes all of the Salmonberry River. It's a pretty sizable area to cover. What we do is we work with all the stakeholders within the Watershed Council to enhance habitat for fish and wildlife. And this takes the form of research, fish passage projects, riparian plantings, in-stream enhancement in the form of large wood or beaver dam analogs. And we do wetland restoration. And we also do educational events and outreach such as the speaker series right now. Tonight, I'm just gonna give you a quick glimpse at one of our projects, which was the Grand Rapids Creek Habitat Enhancement Project that we just got funded. Um, it's a partnership between us and Greenwood Timber. And here you can see that it's on a little tributary to the North Fork Nehalem River. And then down here, you can see Nehalem Bay in the other little circle. Um, so it's about 16 miles from the bay. It's got a really calm gradient, but the substrate in the creek itself is largely cobble and gravel because the velocity of the creek as it moves through is high enough to get all the fines and the um, spotting gravels essentially washed out. And so it ranked high in one of our research projects identifying priority projects for stream enhancement. And so we proposed to put in beaver dam analogs and large wood into the creek to improve habitat for coho. And one of the things that both beaver dam analogs and large wood placements do is they trap and store sediment. They help to block water up so it expands out onto the floodplain, improving that nutrient exchange. It also improves water infiltration so that it recharges the groundwater improving summer flows. Um, and so it's good for a wide variety of salmon, wildlife, and amphibians. It also has the added benefit of um, sometimes it attracts beavers, sometimes it doesn't, but even when it doesn't, it still creates the useful habitat for as long as it persists. Um, so this is a little map of the area. And here's kind of an idea of what this stream looks like. And you'll see there's not a lot of large conifer wood in the stream. And so in this case, we're going to put a beaver dam analog like that one I showed you earlier across the stream here to really block it up and activate the flood channel, channel to both sides. And we'll do the same thing with some large wood placements uh, also in this site. So that's just a little piece of some of the kind of thing we do. Um, this helps to sort gravel as well and improve spawning habitat for salmonids. So um, there you have it. That's another operating beaver dam analog. You can see all the fine sediment here on the upstream end and how much it's actually out and over top of its banks here, even in just, you know, this pretty moderate, uh, you know, winter flow. It wasn't during a rainstorm or anything. So it's kind of neat to see how much floodplain interaction you can get out of a simple structure of woven branches and, and posts. Um, and coho really like these ponds because they're nice and cool in the summer for them to, to hide in. Um, 
We have board meetings. They are uh, on even uh, months of the year on the second Thursday. Everyone's welcome to join us. They happen at Friday on um, Thursdays at 5 p.m. Um, the Zoom links are often are always posted and shared in our emails. You can email me to get added to our list. We are developing a cold water refugia temperature monitoring program. We are probably going to need some volunteers to help out with that. And May 13th, we have Dan Donato talking about revisiting the Labor Day wildfires of 2020, where they really unprecedented. And Dan Donato is a uh, fire ecologist. So it'll be a very interesting talk. Um, so without, that's the end of my bit. Um, Margaret. Thanks so much, Zach. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, everyone on the Watershed Council and Zach for um, letting us from Friends of Cape Falcon Marine Reserve co-host your speaker series tonight. I'm very excited about our speaker and topic. Um, so I just wanted to quickly introduce everyone to Friends of Cape Falcon Marine Reserve if you're not familiar. Um, I am the program coordinator and our organization works to create awareness and understanding of all of Oregon's marine reserves, but in particular, Cape Falcon Marine Reserve, which is the northern northernmost of five marine reserve sites in our state that are managed by Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. And these areas have been designated for conservation of biodiversity and scientific research. So Cape Falcon is the northernmost site um, and it's located between uh, Manzanita and Cannon Beach or really more, more specifically Arch Cape. And um, it's adjacent to Oswald West State Park. So that Oswald West State Park has 2,500 acres of conserved forest land. So having that conserved area next to the marine reserve really kind of boosts the resilience and efficacy of both because those land sea processes are able to happen. It creates wildlife corridors and all that good stuff. Um, and then also it's, it's right by the um, proposed rainforest reserve um, that North Coast Land Conservancy is working on. So when that comes into effect, um, that'll be contiguous with Oswald West State Park, and it'll it'll create a really huge area um, of conservation on land and sea. Which um, so that'll add another five thousand acres. So that's really exciting. Um, so our role is to support Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and outreach and education because they don't really have the capacity to do um, to do the community based uh, outreach and education. And so we do our work mostly through hikes, lectures, like some community science projects and boat tours. And this is the season where we are gearing up for bird monitoring. So um, uh, last week, I think it was, we had a kickoff session that kind of gave an overview of all the um, bird monitoring projects that are available on the coast. And that is available on our YouTube channel. And um, we uh, also do an intertidal bio blitz. And so that is in July and that's another um, community science project that we do. And then in the next coming next few months, those uh, bird monitoring projects are going to be rolling out. So if you're interested in snowy plover monitoring or black oyster catchers or cormorant nest monitoring, visit us on Facebook or our webpage or send me an email at capefalconmr at gmail.com. So, Without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Meg Reed. Um, so Meg Reed is a Coastal Shores Specialist uh, with the Oregon Coastal Management Program. And I've worked with her a little bit on King Tides and really enjoyed that. And I'm excited to hear about this other, but not entirely unrelated topic. <laughs> so um, Meg will be talking about the expected impacts of sea level rise and um, she has been working for a DLCD, which, uh, sorry, Department of Land Conservation and Development, which is the home of the Oregon Coastal Management Program, I think for six years of memory serves. Um, yeah. And she provides technical assistance and policy guidance to cities, counties, and state agencies related to land use planning and hazard mitigation for coastal shore processes and geologic hazards. And Meg received her Bachelor's of Science um, from Roger Williams University in Marine Biology and Environmental Science and has a Master's of Science from the University of New Hampshire 
on the integration of science policy and management of coastal resources. So um, I can't imagine anyone better to tell us about this. <laughs> so thank you so much for being here tonight, Meg. And um, I can't wait to hear your talk. So go for it. Awesome. Thank you, Margaret. Um, Can I make one bookkeeping point? Yes. Um, can folks please uh, keep questions for the end? Uh, we can put any questions you have right into the chat. And then when we get to the end of the presentation, I will read them off or, or, or you know, we can, you, can you can speak in turn. But that way, we don't interrupt Meg as she gets through her, her presentation. Thank Great, you. thank you. Thanks, Zach. And thank you, Margaret. And yes, good evening. Thanks, everyone, for um, being here and for hosting me. I'm excited to be here to talk with you all. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about planning for our changing coastal areas. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about who we are in a minute, but this photo that you see here, um, maybe some of you might recognize, it's um, a beach access point in Bandon, Oregon on the South Coast. Um, and this is during a king tides. Um, so when the, you know, the, the tides are higher than normal. Um, and so you can see the woody debris and the logs kind of right into the beach access point. And so a lot of what I'll be talking tonight is about total water levels and high water levels and how that might be impacting us um, now and into the future and how we can sort of adapt to that. So um, I'll be talking a little bit about um, who we are and what we do, a little bit about the Oregon Coastal Management Program, and then the coastal impacts that we might expect to see from sea level rise, and then go into some adaptation strategies that we're um, thinking about here at the Coastal Program and next steps. So a little bit about our program. Um, the Oregon Coastal Management Program is a federally approved coastal zone management program, which is um, through the, um, it's a voluntary program through the Coastal Zone Management Act of 1972. That's when it was established. Um, and it's administered by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, and it's, like I said, it's a voluntary program and it allows for a partnership between the federal government and coastal states and territories. Um, and it gives, um, it, the federal government gives the states money, which is the carrot. And then in return, you have to meet certain criteria that is set by the federal government, and then you become an approved coastal zone management program. Um, so ours in Oregon was approved in 1977. We were one of the first in the nation, which we're very proud of. Um, and now all almost all of our coastal states and territories participate in the program, except for Alaska, but everyone else participates. Um, and our program here in Oregon is somewhat unique to other programs. It's a very networked program, and what I mean, mean by that is that it's a sort of, there's one agency um, that administers it, and that's the Oregon Department of Land Conservation Development, which is where I work, but then it's really a partnership that is implemented through local governments, state agencies, tribal governments, federal agencies, and the public. So it's really a partnership. Um, all of those entities that work within and benefit from the coastal zone all have have a piece of the Coastal Zone Management Program. And so just to kind of give you a little bit of the geography of what that looks like, um, our coastal zone, our approved coastal zone is watershed based. And so it actually goes from the crest of the coast range all the way out to the edge of the territorial sea, which is three nautical miles. So it's a really large coastal zo zone. And um, that is also somewhat unique to Oregon. Uh, in California, for example, their coastal zone is only the coastal strip. Um, so it's just a pretty narrow strip of land, whereas ours is watershed based. So it gives us a little bit more room to um, be more holistic in our approach to coastal management. And so it includes all seven coastal counties and all 32 coastal cities that you see listed here. Um, and it's a total of 700 or 7,800 square miles of land and 1,100 square miles of water. And then <clears throat> 
in addition to the coastal program, um, we are also the uh, DLCD is also the state's land use planning agency. Um, so that's not just for the coast, but statewide. Um, we're the organization that administers Oregon's statewide planning system, which is also unique um, with throughout the country. Um, and uh, we have sort of a, it's a sort of a similar setup to the, the coastal management program. Um, we have the basis of the, the statewide land use planning system is 19 planning goals that you see listed here on the left hand side um, that cover a lot of different things which every single city and county throughout the state has to comply with um, and the last four of those planning goals are coastal related they're specifically um, focused on the coastal resources so goal 16 is estuarine resources goal 17 is for coastal shorelands goal 18 is on beaches and dunes and goal 19 is ocean resources um, and so in addition to all of the, the well, the 14 goals, because goal 15 is just specific to the Willamette River Greenway, um, all coastal cities and counties have to comply with those extra four goals. Um, and so similarly to the coastal program being a networked program that is implemented through many different entities, so is our land use program. Um, so the Land Conservation Development Commission or LCDC is sort of the overarching body that sets our broad based policy. So they're the ones who sort of set the goals back in the 70s when they were first adopted and then all of the subsequent changes from there. Um, and then the statewide planning goals are really the basis of the program that are actually implemented through city and county comp comprehensive plans and then through state agency programs and authorities. So for example, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife has to comply with all of those, Department of State Lands, Department of Environmental Quality, um, Department of Geology and Mineral Industries and so on. So they're all partners in this, both of both our coastal program in the coastal zone and the statewide, statewide land use planning program. And the reason why I spend a lot of time talking about this and this somewhat complicated structure that we have um, is because this is really how we're going to address climate change. Um, so right now, those goals, um, you know, like I said, they were written in the 70s and some of them have been updated since then, um, but none of them specifically address climate change. Um, they give somewhat of a flexibility to incorporate it if someone were to voluntarily go down that path, but it doesn't require it. Um, and so that is something that we are, are looking at as an agency um, to potentially update, but it also is provides the framework in which we work now. And so that's kind of what I'll be talking about as we move forward is how do we address sea level rise through this planning framework. So I'll talk a little bit now about climate initiatives at DLC, the Department of Land Conservation and Development. Um, so I said, like I said, it's state, it's a statewide program. And um, there's sort of a, a few major buckets that you can think about um, for addressing climate change. There's mitigation, which is trying to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. There's sequestration, which is trying to capture carbon that is in the air and put it into usually something like uh, vegetation. And then there's adaptation, which is, you know, we're already somewhat committed to a certain level of climate change because of our emissions that have already occurred. And so that we're, we have to prepare for those impacts um, that are already occurring and will continue to occur in the future. So that's the part that I'm really going to focus on tonight is that adaptation piece, because that's really where my job sits um, and, and where I'll be talking the most about. <clears throat> but I also just wanted to mention sort of on the rings of this graphic. Um, in case you um, didn't hear about it, or as a reminder, um, Governor Kate Brown's exists issued an executive order in April of 2020 um, to for all state agencies to address climate change to the extent feasible within their existing authorities. Um, so this, a lot of what we're doing and what's listed here, we are sort of already doing, but also we're enhancing because of this executive order. And then um, also on the outer ring, you can see the statewide land use planning goals and program review. So like I was saying, none of the planning goals address climate change directly right now, but it is something that we might, uh, that we are are going to be doing, but what form that takes is still yet to be determined. So it could be a goal 20, that's climate change, or it could be um, all of the goals get individually updated because really climate change is integrated into everything. And so that would be probably the most holistic approach, but it would also be very time consuming and would take a really long time to do that. 
Um, so again, like I said, I'm going to focus on adaptation and just again to remind you what those differences are. Mitigation is action to reduce emissions that cause climate change. Adaptation is action to manage the risks of climate change. Um, and so you can see some activities there in the this graphic. And some there are some activities in which you can um, kind of do both things, um, but then there are um, activities that sort of address one or the other. Um, so for example, in adaptation, you could do things like flood protection or infrastructure upgrades. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the science behind sea level rise because I'm going to assume that most people probably know a little bit about that by now, um, but I will focus a little bit on sea level rise specifically in Oregon because there are some factors that influence our sea level locally. Um, so we haven't really had a lot of sea level rise to date um, because of some factors that I'll talk about, um, but it is starting to speed up. So we are going to start seeing more and more impacts and um, sea level rise is an exponential curve. So it starts out a little slower, but it ramps up over time. Um, so for example, um, I took some data from the Garibaldi tide station, um, which is closest one to your area. Um, and this shows tidal uh, sea level rise forecast from 2016 out to 2050. Um, and it's a range, but the darker line in the middle shows the most likely scenario. Um, and so with sea level rise data, you know, we are working with an uncertainty because of those emissions factors. We are, we've already um, emitted certain certain amount of emissions that are causing climate change, but we don't know what our future emissions are going to be. That's really dependent on what we do as a society uh, worldwide, you know, what our, our factors are, and then the feedback loops that that contributes to with um, the ice sheets melting and um, permafrost thawing and so on and so forth. Um, so those that's where the uncertainty comes from. Um, so you can see for Garibaldi, it ranges from about five inches up to 20 inches by the um, year 2050, which is a pretty big range, um, but the most likely is 15 inches, which again is a fairly pretty big number. Um, so that's kind of what we expect along the entire Oregon coast. Um, on the southern Oregon coast and the northern Oregon coast, we expect a little bit less um, because of some local tectonics, but the central coast is probably going to see the highest levels of sea level rise um, in that 15 to 20 inch range. Um, so again, those factors that influence sea level locally here in Oregon, um, a lot has to do with our um, seasonal kinds of variations in weather patterns. So for example, El Ninos, um, that's, they typically happen in the wintertime and can cause elevated water levels, higher wave energy, and the souther southerly shift in wave directions. Um, so we just see higher water levels during those El Nino winters. And then with a warming climate, we can expect that there will be more El Nino winters. So that means higher water levels more frequently in the winter. Um, we also experience vertical land motion um, so we are on the Cascadia subduction zone, and we've actually been uplifting for a while now, um, a little bit over time every year. Um, and that's really what's been keeping us from experiencing sea level rise in a more dramatic way to date. Um, but like I said, it's starting to catch up and overtake the vertical land motion. And just as a reminder, when we have a Cascadia earthquake, we will experience uh, severe land subsidence and at the time of the earthquake, and which will drop um, our levels immediately, pretty severely in some cases. And so then we will have sea level rise at a very different scale. Um, and then we have P Pacific decadal oscillations as well, which again is a seasonal sort of um, on a longer term scale changes the water level and the water pattern. But overall, um, in the Pacific Northwest region, we expect um, the, the sea level rise projections are between about a half a foot to five feet by 2100. And this picture, in case you don't recognize it, is also during a king tides um, in Newport at the Nye Beach turnaround. So you can see really high water levels um, coming up and affecting beach access. So what I really want to emphasize through this presentation is that sea level rise is one layer of water. And what we really are worried about is total water levels in Oregon. So you can think of that as piles of water that add up on top of each other. So this picture I really like, it's actually from Hawaii during um, when they were doing some King Tides outreach. But I like that they use these um, yoga blocks to kind of pile up the different types of um, 
water levels that get affected, um, the, that affect the total water level. So you can see sea level rise, then some local, um, like the El Nino, ocean eddies, and then coastal storms, which we experience mostly in the wintertime, and then the king tide. So a higher than normal king, or a higher than normal high tide. Um, so all those things sort of add up. When they happen at the same time, on the same day, they can cause really big impacts. And that's what we are concerned about, is that threshold point when things overtop the dune or overtop a riprap or overtop the bank, when that, that really becomes the issue, when it causes erosion or flooding or other impacts. Um, and if it happens more frequently, then that becomes much more problematic. So that's what we're really um, focused on is the total water level. So to show you a little bit what that looks like, in Oregon. Um, this is an example, and I took this slide from our partners at the Department of Geology and Mineral Industries. Um, this is an event that happened in 1999 in the winter, um, and this is this photo is from the south coast in Port Orford. Um, and so you can see there's a barrier beach um, out on the uh, sort of between the Pacific Ocean and Garrison Lake, a coastal lake. And during this time, um, the wave run up plus the tide for the event equaled 26 feet. And the barrier beach elevation is 24 feet. So there was about two feet of water overtopping this barrier beach. And so, you know, a barrier beach, luckily, there's not a lot of development there or um, other things that might be severely impacted by by the water, but if you imagine that being a dune that has houses behind it or a road or something like, or a, you know, a water treatment plant or something like that, it would have severe impacts. So if, this is kind of what we're talking about, these events in which there's a threshold that's reached and then overtopped. So now I'll turn to how does this high water impact us on the coast? Um, and this might be a familiar landmark to some of you. Um, this is the Nahalem, Nahalem River and um, a boat ramp um, along that. That's again, during a king tide. So you can see, and probably a pretty big rain event as well to combine for this high water level. Um, so we can expect from sea level rise that a lot of the chronic coastal hazards that we already experience will be exacerbated. So increased erosion, both chronic and episodic. Um, so chronic being the stuff that just happens on sort of a day-to-day -day basis um, when the water comes back to the back of the beach and erodes the bank or the riprap and, and things like that over time versus a more dramatic event that might happen during a bigger event and large chunks of land are lost at once. Then we can also expect coastal landslides and bluff failure to happen more frequently. Uh, the picture on the left-hand side is in Glen Eden Beach. Um, that was during a big storm event in the winter time that caused um, some pretty massive bluff failure. And then um, on the right-hand side is uh, Highway 101, just north of Newport. Um, there's, uh, in this particular location, there's an active landslide complex on the east and uh, lots of coastal erosion happening on the west, so it's a pretty complex and dynamic place right there on the highway. Um, <clears throat> we can also expect overtopping and flooding. Um, so, you know, again, like I was saying before, overtop water overtopping dunes or bluffs or um, the riprap you can see in this picture on the left. That's the community of Nescoin, which is in southern Tilma Til Til County during an El Nino winter event. And then on the right hand side, I'm sure this is also a familiar um, place for many of you. This is down, downtown Nahalem, which definitely experiences a good amount of flooding. This is also during a king tide event um, and it's Highway 101 running through there um, impacting travel and businesses and so on. And then we can also expect inundation of beaches, loss of public access, and coastal squeeze and landward migration. And what I mean by coastal squeeze is imagine like rocky habitats along the coast where they don't really have the ability to move as the water level increases. Um, so they'll be squeezed in those areas and potentially habitats lost. And then um, landward migration, meaning, um, you know, in an estuarine environment where you have a wetland, um, wetlands actually do have the ability to accrete 
retreat and potentially keep up with sea level rise, but only if they have room to move. So if they're um, if they're going into undeveloped land, that would be great. But if there's like a bulkhead or a resonance or a marina or something behind them, um, then they might not be able to do that landward migration. So um, that could be another challenge as well. So those are kind of some of the the general impacts that we can expect from future sea level rise. Um, some of the ways that we've tried to understand that through data, um, we were able to complete a study in 2016 um, that was mapping future sea level rise in Oregon's estuaries. So we were able to do this in every estuary except for the Columbia River estuary. Um, and this looked at sea level rise projections for 2030, 2050, and 2100, and also looked at um, these scenarios under a 1% and a 5% chance flood event. Um, so that's a 100 year and a 500 year flood event. Um, and then map that over existing assets within these estuaries to see what would be impacted under which scenarios and when. Um, so things like fire departments, schools, wastewater treatment plants, airports, uh, roads, potential contaminants, and so on. This screenshot is from the Coos Bay Estuary. And all of this information is publicly available, the, both the data viewer and the report. Um, it's that we have, um, we host a coastal atlas. Um, I would encourage anyone who hasn't checked it out to do so. It has lots of different tools available there for anyone to, lo to look through. And this one is coastalatlas.net slash sea level rise. And kind of just going into that study a little bit more on the right hand side shows um, pictures all of the estuaries um, and they're colored by their relative exposure to future flooding. And so there's 2030, 2050 and 2100 and you can see that in the 2030 scenario, Coos Bay is one of the most affected estuaries. But as time progresses, you can see by 2100, the Nicanicum, Siletz Bay, Yuquina, Alsi Bay, all become severely impacted. Um, so it really matters like the, the height of the sea level rise projection um, that really impacts those estuaries over time and the, the assets within them. And on the left is just the, sort of a graphical depiction of those different water levels. So again, it's getting at that total water level event, you know, not just sea level rise, but what other events could compile on top of that to make the total water a lot more um, impactful. And so as an example, um, under these analyses, we found that five municipal water intakes, eight water wastewater treatment plants, 58 potential contaminant sources are exposed to a 1% annual chance flood in 2100. So definitely some assets at risk um, under these different future scenarios. So that's really why we need to turn to adaptation and adaptation strategies. And so, you know, we, we're sort of getting a better understanding of what impacts we might ex expect on the Oregon coast, but now we need to think about how we're going to address those impacts. So <clears throat> there's a couple of different kinds of bins that you can put strategies into. And what I'm gonna talk about is definitely not exhaustive or comprehensive, but just kind of a couple of things that we're thinking about and, and um, that others throughout the country have been thinking about as well. Um, so you can think of protecting. Um, that's when you could place a hard or soft barrier between development and the sea to reduce exposure to flooding or erosion. So hard protection would be things like riprap and seawalls, whereas soft protection would be maybe enhancing natural infrastructure, like building up a sand dune, vegetating a sand dune, um, adding sand to the beaches, expanding wetlands. Um, and we already, I would say, I'm not going to go into it too much, but we already have some pretty strict um, requirements and laws already in place about hard armoring, um, both on the outer and the inner coasts. Um, but um, there's still room for, for more of it under, under existing um, land use laws. And then there's accommodate, which is modifying or designing development in a ways that withstand sea level rise without damage. Um, so you can think of elevating a building or flood proofing structures. And then there's relocate, which is removing or moving existing development to less risky areas and then limiting the construction of new development in vulnerable areas. So generally, I think of the protect and to some extent accommodate as short term solutions. They might work for a while, but at some point they're going to be overtopped. And then relocation is more of a long term strategy. And this is probably the most difficult one to actually implement. There's a lot that comes with that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. 
So I'll talk a little bit now that we're we're getting into the adaptation strategies and thinking about what we can do um, throughout our coastal communities. I really wanna go back to this role of land use planning, which we kind of started the talk with. Um, land use planning is obviously what we do. We're the state's land use planning agency. And so that's really the viewpoint that we're coming from, but it is a really important role. Um, and so this picture I show because I think it really um, demonstrates the importance of land use planning. So um, like I said, the statewide planning system came into effect in the 70s. So this is an aerial shot of Pacific City and these homes to the south are um, buildings were all built before 70, the 70s when these land use plans went into effect. And you can see that they're actually built in the, in the four dune complex um, and they experience a lot of um, problems with accretion of sand and, er, and coastal erosion. And then this development that's just to the north, you can see a vegetated dune there that's stabilized and is protecting the development immediately behind it from erosion and flooding. And that development happened after the 1970s. And that's because we have the statewide planning goal 18 beaches and dunes actually prohibits the development on active four dunes. Um, uh, you can't build houses, commercial or industrial buildings on um, anything that's basically subject to ocean wave overtopping. So you can really see that stark difference in land use planning and the effect that it can have on development. So what we're doing now at the Coastal Program is we are um, developing a sea level rise planning guide that is targeted to coastal planners um, for all of our cities and counties on the coast um, to adapt and, and, and create um, adaptation strategies for sea level rise impacts. And we consider this guide um, the first of an upcoming resilience series. So we're really trying to target um, creating technical expertise and resources and support to then help our local communities update their conference of plans and um, land use planning strategies. So we're working on this now and we're hoping to um, send it out to local governments by July of this year. Um, and so we're actively working on it now, which means I can't really give you a ton of details because we haven't ironed everything out yet, but I'll kind of go into some of the high level things that we have been doing. So um, these, this little graphic on the lower right hand shows the major topics that we'll be covering in the guide. So the sea level rise science tailored to the Oregon coast, local policy and planning. So how do we use our existing planning structure and framework to adapt to sea level rise? The legal context, because as you might imagine, there is a lot of legal um, implement, implement, uh, implications for um, doing this kind of stuff. Like, um, like there are some things around private property and takings that we have to be really careful of with um, things that are our ex already in existence. So there's a lot of legal stuff to, to cover. And then we'll go into adaptation and mitigation actions that could be taken. And then how, once they pick those things, how to finance them, what are their financial options? And then of course, education and outreach components, because obviously we can't really do major changes to our planning systems without having public support and buy-in. So it's really important to have public engagement along the way and to give feedback and to give um, uh, really important um, expertise into that process to make sure that that people are, are a part of what their community will look like and continue to look like. So um, this might be a bit of a boring slide, but um, this kind of talks through the, the stepwise process that we're sort of thinking through to help our local governments incorporate sea level rise. So step one would be choose a range of sea level rise projections. So like I said, there's a lot of uncertainty in these numbers and they can have um, implications in kind of the different things that we're planning for. So for example, the lifetime of a house versus the lifetime of a wastewater treatment plant versus the lifetime of a road. Um, you might use different sea level rise projections for those different aspects of planning. Then uh, step two, identify potential impacts of sea level rise in the area. Um, so what what is projected to be impacted? Is it going to be estuarine areas? Is it open coast? Is it um, you know, the uh, dunes, the beaches, what's gonna be impacted? And then assess the risks to coastal resources and development. So again, what is at stake there? Is it a bunch of roads, houses, um, schools, things like that? And then identify adaptation measures and policy options to try to address those risks. Um, and that might be through changing zoning designations or um, doing like a elevating a highway or relocating a highway and so on. 
And then whatever the strategies are that are um, agreed upon, they have to be adopted. Um, maybe not if it's a project, but if it's um, anything that changes land use laws, so it would have to be adopted into their comprehensive plan and land use ordinances. Um, and that's a public process um, that ultimately would be decided upon by the elected officials of the community. So the um, Board of County Commissioners or City Council. And then monitor and revise as needed. You know, this is kind of a new thing that we're all doing. And so we'll have to see how these decisions are playing out over time and if they need to be tweaked or overhauled. And then it's an iterative process because like I said, there's a lot of uncertainty in these projections. And so the science will change somewhat over time and we'll learn more based on emission scenarios and things like that. So those projections might need to be updated over time. So they might have to be reevaluated every five years or so. So we do need to really think about being flexible in our planning processes, which is hard for, for a lot of um, government processes to do as they are, but um, we'll have to try to build some of that in there. Um, so I'll kind of go into a little bit more concrete examples of what I'm talking about. I've kind of mentioned a little bit before, but you could update land and zoning designations. So for example, wetland, you could do wetland migration zoning, which you could take if there's undeveloped areas um, behind a wetland, you can change that from residential to open space so that it doesn't get developed in the future and the wetlands have space to migrate. You could do something like a coastal hazard overlay zone. Um, and so this graphic kind of depicts what that what I mean by that. And this is actually taken from King, King County Planning, which is in um, Washington and where Seattle is um, because they've been doing a lot of sea level rise planning um, over the past several years where you know most communities have to have flood regulations that are um, required by FEMA. And you would have flood maps and then there's a, attached some um, land use and development restrictions within that zone. But currently FEMA flood maps don't incorporate sea level rise in their mapping. And so you could expand those existing flood zones to be sea level rise zones and attach the same sorts of regulations and restrictions onto those additional areas that are within the sea level rise zone um, because they really would be subject to similar risks. And then just incorporating sea level rise numbers and calculations into all planning types. Um, so it could be in setback calculations for oceanfront development, um, for flood mapping. Like I said, it's not required, but it could be um, uh, voluntarily incorporated um, at the at the local level. And then um, in things like geologic reports, which are required for a lot of development that happens in hazard zones, you could just add sea level rise or other climate as part of the analysis that has to be done anyway to, for development to occur. So these are just some ideas of how we might do that kind of adaptation in Oregon. And then sort of at a higher arching level, um, Communities have comprehensive plans, which set the broad policy, and then land use ordinances, which implement it. Um, and so at a broad level, um, what's important about setting those policies is that it doesn't only affect um, private development that happens, but also public projects that happen, you know, like new roads and water treatment and, and things like that. So you could say something like all new development shall be cited and designed to minimize risks from sea level rise over the life of the structure. So again, that's really important to think about the lifetime of the structure and how much sea level rise you can expect in that lifespan. Um, so it, maybe it's okay to develop it now or even in 10 years, but by 2050, when we still hope that it's operating, then it's going to be under maybe a foot or more of sea level rise. So is it really prudent to, to put public dollars into an investment like that when you expect to have you know, a certain amount of sea level rise inundation over time? <clears throat> so that's kind of the local strategies that I wanted to talk about. And obviously there's a lot of things that still need to be done and we're just kind of starting into this. But I also wanted to talk about the bigger picture. Um, so some of you may have heard um, right now in, in the California legislature, there's a, um, a bill called Buy Rent Retreat. And um, it's it's not a new idea, but it's, a, it's the first time being proposed at this scale. So basically the idea is that the state would buy out in a neighborhood or an area that is subject to chronic erosion or flooding and will continue to be under sea level rise scenarios um, and then rent it back to either the same homeowners or new ones um, to try to recoup some of the cost of buying those people out and allow them to live there as long as it's safe. And then when the threshold is reached, which would be agreed upon 
uh, before anything gets st started, um, then they would have to leave and move, um, and the state would take back that land and um, remove the infrastructure, remove the development, and allow it to, you know, um, naturally get flooded and and eroded over time to give a buffer room um, for the coast. So that's kind of a really cool idea, I think, um, and and hopefully something that gets passed in California and can be used as a model elsewhere. Um, we already have sort of a buyout option through FEMA, but it is a little bit clunky and um, it, it's still done on a voluntary basis um, and it doesn't cover the entire cost of a structure. Um, and there are some other things in the works, but um, this is sort of a more overarching policy at looking at um, retreat, managed retreat. and. This picture is actually not from California. It's actually from Louisiana, um, and where they have ex have been experiencing sea level rise at a much higher rate than we are here or really anywhere else. Um, and you can see these homes that are out in the water, and there's still power lines, and there's still infrastructure out there that hasn't been removed. And the point that I'm making with this is, you know, managed retreat is a really hard topic, and it's hard for lots of reasons. It's emotional and it's legally challenging. But if you don't do managed retreat, you do unmanaged retreat, and that is a lot worse, in my opinion. Um, so even though it's really difficult, I think that, you know, we're trying to talk about it here and, and try to get some buy-in because I think it, at least it's important to start to plan that because sea level rise is happening and it will continue to happen. And, you know, we're going to have to deal with this at some point. So I'll just leave, uh, end this talk with this cartoon. Going back to my point that sea level rise might start slowly, but it gets exponential over time. And right now we have this opportunity in Oregon to be really proactive because we haven't seen a lot of big impacts yet. And we still won't experience it quite the same as other places. So I think in a lot of ways we are lucky, um, but we still have to deal with some pretty big impacts. So it's really important to start this planning as soon as possible. And, and hopefully we are. Um, so thank you so much for, for listening. I hope that um, that you have some good questions and some good discussion, and I'm happy to stay in touch. This is my email, so please um, feel free to reach out. So thank you. Thank you so much. That was fantastic, and it's really neat to, um, I, I like big systems thinking and <laughs> like thinking about how we like address the coming challenges like this and it's really neat to see that this process process is going on and uh and, and learn a bit about it um nadia has a question in the chat and i don't know if you want to ask it yourself nadia or do you want me to read it out for you go ahead and read it zach oh cool great so the question is clatsop county is currently updating our comprehensive plan do our planners know that the sea level rise planning guide is coming? Have there been any serious, has there been any serious conversation with North Coast cities and counties about limiting development and development uh, and retreat in vulnerable areas? For example, Seaside, Cannon Beach, Falcon Cove, to Halem. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, this is, uh, excuse me, this is Commissioner Webb from class of county. Nadia, why didn't you pick up the telephone and call me and ask me this question? <laughs> um, we are about to embark um, this year as part of our strategic uh, plan planning for uh, the county's uh, board of commissioners. And um, I'm actually gonna be leading um, a section on um, environmental issues uh, <clears throat> relating to the county. And um, we are gonna, this is gonna be one of the many climate change issues that we are gonna be addressing. Um, we're focusing primarily on water because we know that no matter what happens in the future, <laughs> we have to have the quantity and quality of water that sustains human beings. Um, and so um, that's the answer from Clatsop County. Yeah, thank you. And this incidentally was a terrific, this was a terrific presentation, Meg. Oh, and you. I really looking forward, with, oh, the other issue is that we are, um, we are in, <clears throat> even though there is no goal for climate change, um, 
uh, we are going, we're redoing our comp plan right now. And we have, the board has instructed uh, the planning staff to make sure that climate change is addressed in every one of our goals. Thank okay. you. Yeah, no, thank you. That's that's great to hear. And I, I think you're right. You know, I think a lot of communities are doing it on their own, you know, voluntarily um, without without it being a requirement. Um, so I, you know, we've definitely seen it. I think the city of Nehalem has also um, done some work in their in their comprehensive plan update to incorporate um, climate change into those policies. I would say it's like people are, are going down those paths, um, but what we're trying to do is provide some extra resources to do it um, and give them some more support and technical expertise to, because it is, you know, it's a hard issue it's, and it's complicated. Um, so I think, you know, that's what we'll continue to do. And, um, you know, in the, com in the comprehensive plan updates, I mean, it's such a huge process to do and most of them have not been updated for a long time. So um, mm -hmm. it's great to see that there's, I think, you know, several jurisdictions are kind of going down that path and we'll continue to, so we'll just continue to try and, and help them and to incorporate climate change into those plans. Meg, can I just ask one other question? Of course. Yeah. Um, about, I think, 60% of the coastline, remember, we are um, one of the few counties, I, I heard actually in America, that have um, two separate coastlines. And I'm very disappointed that you all didn't talk about the Columbia River, because um, <laughs> it is the source uh, you, of many, well, first of all, our watersheds, mm -hmm. which provide drinking water for all of our citizens, um, you know, about half of them um, go into the Columbia River. And I, I, I just wish maybe we can have a conversation sometime about how do we make that happen? Mm -hmm. um, because it's enormous. I mean, we have, uh, I just spent a couple of hours tonight with our coastal, uh, our river council watershed, which includes all the communities on the, on the North coast. And it's, and it's a lot of land mm -hmm. and it's a lot of land that is, that is populated and when the, and where there's a lot of forestry going on. So um, yeah. anyway, uh, but, but just tell somebody. <laughs> Or, or, or I'll call the governor tomorrow and, and, and complain about that. Sounds but good. Thank you. It. This was terrific, Meg. It really was. This was just so informative. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's nice to have... Um these nice conversations. And um, yes, I agree with you. It would have been nice to have the Columbia River um, in that exposure analysis that we did. I think, you know, I don't know enough details and I'll have to um, find some out and get back to you, but I think there have been some other things that have been done outside of our agency to address um, the Columbia River watershed and impacts from sea level rise, but I'll have to um, do a little digging on that. Um, yeah, we had um, a NOAA Coastal Management Fellow do that project and the Columbia River is such a big, thing, you know, so it was outside of her project scope at the time, but I, I agree with you. It's definitely something that needs to be done. Thank, so, you. thank you. Yeah. Um, we have another question here in the chat. This one um, from Will Russell asking, are these planning and analyses uh, are incorporated in a subduction zone event scenario, given the high likelihood of, of an event? Um, parentheses, one in five in 50 years, if memory serves. Uh, so are we considering how much a subduction zone event, I think, is going to release and, and drop elevation um, when we're looking at these this planning? Yeah, so in some ways, yes. So the, um, the sea level rise projections for our coast specifically do incorporate tectonic uplift. Um, so the, the offset of that tectonic plate is being accounted for. Um, and in the tsunami modeling, um, that incorporates the subsidence. So the inundation maps that have been produced by the Department of Geology and Mineral Industries, um, that, that inundation level does account for subsidence. So um, the extent of water is, you know, the true extent of water. Um, 
what is not really what could be done um, over time is uh, you could play with scenarios of like, if you know, a Cascade subduction zone happened tomorrow um, versus in 2050, um, you know, like how would that change the water levels? And that's something that would be really complicated. I know that we've talked with our partners at, Geo at the Department of Geology about mm -hmm. that, um, of like what the water level would be post earthquake. Um, and then incorporating um, the other part that you could do is like incorporate sea level rise into the tsunami modeling over time. So like adding future projection. So like, you know, if the earthquake happened in 2050, what is, because right now those tsunami maps take into account current sea level, right? But they don't incorporate future sea level. Um, and so that would impact potentially um, the, the water levels and where they go. So that is something that we haven't done, but could do. But I think what be, would be more challenging is like uh, estimating the water level and where it would be post tsunami, because, you know, it kind of depends on like how big the magnitude earthquake is and if it's a full rupture versus a partial rupture. And there's just so many scenarios that you would have to play with that I think that would be really complicated. I now need to look into a lot more about different types of <laughs> tectonic <laughs> scenarios and figure out what full rupture and partial rupture <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. I could, I could talk about that too because that's also part of my job is also tsunami planning. So I know a lot about the Cascade subduction zone. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I do have another question here though, uh, but before you talk to me about ruptures. Um, <laughs> yeah. So Kristen, and I, I, I apologize if I get your last name wrong, wrong uh, Koptiuk? Koptiuk? Uh, asks, the winter king tides already demonstrated in pretty dramatic ways the uh, potential impact of the inevitable sea level rise. They flooded boat launches, town streets, overran 101 in places, and dramatically left steep vertical cuts in the dunes along the beaches from at least Barview to Manzanita. Cities have got to address planning for this way sooner than later, and yet new homes are still going up all along the coast up here. How is your agency making efforts to convey the urgency of addressing sea level rise now? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I mean, we've we've been challenged with coastal hazards in extreme ways for a long time, like regardless of sea level rise. Um, and uh, you know, we've see, still seen development happen in questionable places. Um, so, you know, I think we're doing what we can, but. Um, our structure is such that it's like I said, it's a um, it's a pretty bottom up approach. So you know, while our agency does administer the overarching planning program, um, we can't really require certain things until we change laws and change rules, and that also takes a lot of time, unfortunately. So it's really hard to like address the urgency issue um, through traditional. Um, ways of rulemaking and, um, you know, amending laws and things like that. You know, I would say where the pressure could maybe come from that it hasn't really come from yet is from the state legislature, um, you know, the elected officials and the Senate and, and the House, um, where that could, you know, they could change policy from that perspective, and that has not really happened. Um, so, you know, there, there could be a, the potential for our agency, you know, as we're updating the planning goals and things like that, that um, we could require local governments to address sea level rise in their oceanfront development standards and things like that. Um, but that would, again, take time. Um, so I think it's more just conversations and talking with people, but um, it is, there are pressures, as you can imagine, from various um, sources. And, um, and, and so I think there's also some private property issues too. And um, so we're trying to like navigate those different things and manage it um, and still try to allow for development, but to allow for it in smart ways that accounts for hazards. Um, because yeah, then once you have existing development, it's really challenging then because if they're if they're having chronic issues, then, you know, there's not a lot of great options besides armoring or retreat generally. Um, so those are, you know, those are kind of the, the biggest options, but yeah, so we're, we're working on it, but I would say it's probably, probably not as fast as some people would like. Um, the next question in the chat is uh, a follow-up from, from, from Will Russell asking, back of envelope uh, calculations suggest that in 50 years with a big subduction event, we are looking at 
um, 50 inches or more of rise with it, with the combination of sea level rise and a subduction event. Is that in the ballpark in your viewpoint as well? Is that, is that about accurate? Or um, yeah, I think that is probably pretty good. So from my understanding, when we have subsidence, it can vary between like three and six or seven feet. Um, and then if you have, you know, I said about a half a foot to five feet by 2100. Um, so what, like, let's say that's, you know, three feet by 2050. So you have three feet plus seven feet is 10 feet. So you could potentially by 2050 have 10 feet of sea level rise in a day, you know, like if the subtraction zone happens then. So yeah, yeah. that could be pretty dramatic. I think, um, you know, like to cut to the planning piece, like, so we are doing some tsunami planning and that is mostly addressing critical essential facilities. So like prohibiting the development of like schools, fire stations, hospitals in the tsunami inundation zone um, or the most likely tsunami inundation zones. It doesn't necessarily really focus on like residential development um, and versus what like we might be doing with the sea level rise planning. And what I'd say is that it's really, I would say it's going to be difficult to make the case to um, plan for the like the unknown of when the event might happen for like those kinds of development options. Like I don't think people are really going to go for banning residential development in um, the tsunami inundation zone, you know, plus the sea level rise. So I think it's kind of like we have to be choosing which is the greater risk and what the community is really concerned, the most concerned about. And the other thing that we've been focusing on with the tsunami planning is evacuation planning. So making sure that like wherever people are, they can get to high ground safely and effectively too. And then obviously education along with that. Great. Um, I have a question from Scott Starbuck. And the question is, will you file lawsuits against fossil fuel companies to help pay for seawalls, raising roads, et cetera? Well, I mean, right now, well, no, probably um, we're not going to be um, we're like our agency is not going to be filing lawsuits. I mean, that that might be happening at a different level, um, but um, we have pretty strict requirements around hard armoring. Um, and right now, uh, unless it's a public project, which also has some pretty big sideboards around it, like so private development that has, you know, that wants a seawall and is eligible under our current laws to, to apply for a permit, they have to pay for it. So private owners pay for riprap and seawalls and things like that. Um, if you were gonna do say, raising a road, that's a different story. That would probably be public money, um, but uh, that would probably be like transportation funds or things like that. So I, I don't know for sure how those things would be paid for. There's probably like several options that you could go down, but I would say that generally our department itself is not going to be filing lawsuits. Can I follow up on that? Sure. Is that okay? Yeah, I noticed like with the tobacco situation, when the early tobacco lawsuits were filed against tobacco companies, it was like David and Goliath kind of thing, but Eventually, I think the tobacco companies ended up paying out um, vast sums of money. And so certain jurisdictions around the United States have already filed lawsuits against fossil fuel companies unsuccessfully. But just like with the Roundup thing, you know, um, sooner or later, they might start to win. It would, because I'm from Oregon and love Oregon and love the Oregon coast, it would be wonderful for Oregon to get some help for paying for this expensive uh, response to the sea level rise, which was primarily caused by the fossil fuel companies who'd known about this since 1959. And uh, if you're interested in that, I have a climate blog called uh, riverseekblogspot.com that has the videos, but I already feel like I'm going on too long about it. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's going to be expensive, you know, in, lo in lots of ways. And, um, and it's going to be difficult to pay for. So I, I don't know like how that's going to play out. Um, I can only speak to the experiences, you know, that I've been a part of and, um, and how our agency sort of works, but it, it's possible that there might be some of that, you know, maybe at the, at the legislature level or, you know, at the federal level or something like that, that might be looking into those, those different aspects. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have another question here from 
Lydia asking if people are allowed to continue to build in areas that are in danger according to sea level rise projections or even existing issues you talked about when they are flooded out, will it be public funds that pay for uh, reparations or retreat? Repeat. Um, yeah. yeah, it's a good question. I don't know that I totally know the answer to that. Um, it probably depends on a few things. Um, you know, they might have insurance, private insurance that might cover some of it. Um, but it is certainly a concern of ours and of Oregon and particular Oregon Parks and Recreation um, because they are the one, they are the stewards of the public beach. So, you know, for example, if there was a house on the oceanfront that, you know, was experiencing erosion and then ended up like falling pieces of it onto the public beach. I mean, it's ultimately, it's, it is a responsibility of the homeowner to pay for that. But if they don't have the ability to pay for it, then like, are we just going to leave it there? Probably not. And so like, who's going to pay for that state funds, most likely. So I think that's why it's important to have a more proactive discussion to talk about that, like the manage retreat idea, because the more you can plan ahead for those types of things to happen, the better off hopefully everyone will be. Um, I would also recommend, uh, so that that article that I mentioned, the um, buy rent retreat idea that California is pursuing, um, you can look it up on NPR. They have a really great article about it. And I would say it's, um, it's an interesting thing to read if you're interested in that, because they talk about that, you know, like, so, so for example, in California, I mean, obviously it's a very different coast development pattern than we have here. And they have these million, million, million dollar homes there, right, on the oceanfront and who are potentially at, at risk. And if you pass this bill, then you're using taxpayer dollars to buy out the wealthiest people um, on the oceanfront. And there is some debate over that, like, should you um, like allow public funds to be used to pay for the wealthiest people? And there is some, there's been some, um, studies by economists that have shown that actually it is worth it for the state to pay that money in the because in the long term it saves money um, from that like those um, things happening in a more unmanaged way um, so it, it's a really interesting article and I encourage you to look into it um, but it is a, it's definitely um, a difficult question of like who pays for what <laughs> um, and like what Scott was just saying too about you know who who's really responsible for this and and so on so um, I think it's going to be an ongoing conversation an ongoing debate um, for sure like yeah <laughs> That's one of the funny parts about all policy conversations <laughs> is that like, there are so many questions of, of, of equity along the way as well. And so, yeah, Absolutely. thank you. Yeah. Um, I think this next question might've been for, uh, for, for Pam and Pam might've already answered it. Um, <laughs> the geologist solid estimates are one fifth, 20% chance of wiping out most estuarine dairies and millions and millions of ongoing development in 50 years uh, through a subduction event, right? Um, how is Clatsop County considering the strong likelihood? <laughs> um, and so that was directed towards Clatsop County and- And I replied. And, and you replied. Oops, I have made a freshman mistake of revealing myself. The answer is, <laughs> No, I think no. It is a big concern though, when we look around um, also in our own area, uh, because we do have so much of our um, agricultural infrastructure that is in uh, areas that are very vulnerable to both sea level rise and uh, a subduction event. Yeah. And yeah. so um, that's going to be, um, it, it, if, what an event like that were to happen, we would suddenly be not just vulnerable personally in that a lot of our roads and infrastructure would be impacted by it, but there'd be some of the major economic drivers of our region would be heavily impacted too. And that's going to be- Right. The, the best thing I can tell you, Zach, is that we, we have a very different agricultural um, um, sector 
yeah. than you than Tillamook does. Yeah. I mean, we have, um, uh, yeah, our you know our big product here is timber. Ah, and, yep. Fair. And we have, and our our farms tend to be small specialized farms. We don't have a lot of animal growing. Um, yeah. We, we don't have a lot of production. Um, and so it's for us, I, I honestly, I, that this is why I love being places like this where people ask us great questions. Um, <laughs> yeah. Is that we, we don't, um, I, as I say, first of all, our agricultural industry is uh, trees. But we have a very, very wonderful, robust growing small farm, um, farm to table, you know, t types of produce. And, um, and so I, I really don't think, um, and those are upland incidentally, hmm. all yeah. of our farms. We have very few, we do have a few, um, um, animal, um, yeah, I'm trying to, I'm, excuse me, I'm going through the map. Um, we do have a few animal producers who are within somewhat of inundation zones, but, um, but not a lot. And, and I, only one that I can think of actually on the coast. So I, I don't think that's an issue for us. Me, I really don't. Yeah, I mean, it's an. There are sort of, um, you know, the more you get into the climate planning, the more complex you realize it is because you know there are some things that you want to protect that end up having unintended consequences in other ways. So you know, speaking of farms, you know, Oregon has some of the. Um, richest soils in the world for agriculture and you know we have land use laws that very much protect farm and forest land you know not only for farming but also for forests and timber um, and you know in a lot of ways um, that's a that's a benefit from a climate perspective if you can have those farm to table things that you were just talking about where you can have your food grown closer to where you need to eat it instead of it shipping all over the world and so that can help with mitigating greenhouse gases but if you're saying you know that most of your farms are in the inundation zone or in the sea level rise zone, then what is the adaptation strategy to make sure that those farms can still produce that localized food um, and mitigate those greenhouse gases elsewhere? So it is it is really hard. Like you have to think about the whole picture and these um, you know these unintended consequences that might come up because as you're planning, you sort of realize that they're the solution might not be the same for every problem. And sometimes the solution can want to one thing can be a problem for another. Um, so that is really, that is really challenging. Um, we have another comment here in the chat, which is uh, exactly this public buyouts of protection for wealthy homeowners is already happening in Miami. So that's going back to the previous question about um, about using public funds, I think, for, for retreat, so. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. It's already um, down there. The other thing that we sort of think about too is, um, you know, like I mentioned, the protect option is sort of like a short-term option. Um, so something that we've been thinking about and like trying, want to try to avoid anyway, is like if you protect things as a short-term strategy that can turn into a long-term strategy because then you're sort of incentivizing the property value by protecting it in the short term and so that continues to make you know homes valuable and then being able to sold, be sold and things like that but if you start to take away that value um, you know one thing that we've been talking about in planning the sea level rise guide is that um, on the legal end of set um, on things that if a community makes like a an intention known very clearly so let's say you know the community decides we are not going to 
allow any more armoring on the coastline. Um, then you have a little bit of legal protection for new development and new homeowners um, that they could say like, well, you knew going in that we were not going to help you protect. And that can help drive these private market incentives where, you know, maybe that person can't get insurance anymore for their home. And then they maybe on their own will retreat, you know, because the value isn't there anymore. Um, so, you know, it's, it's complicated and it's not a perfect solution, but kind of trying to de-incentivize the risky behavior, which can be helped through the private market to some extent, um, but helped with the public policy. Um, so it's trying to find that right balance um, to, to make those things work. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Feel free to pop them right in the chat if you have any more. I had a question about um, how, you know, this, is, this has been a really um, great conversation and lots of issues brought up and really substantive and I'm loving it. Um, but I'm wondering like how does the average person um, influence these policies um, and try to make uh, the, the smarter options happen? I'm wondering if you have any perspective on that. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, yes, there are ways, um, you know, for better or worse, um, sometimes when these things come up, the people who are the most vocal tend to be those who um, have, you know, of the homes on the ocean front, for example. Um, and so it is really important that if you feel differently, uh, that you should also make your voice known. Um, so, you know, going to your, um, your commissioners, for example, um, and talking to them or your city councilors um, or, or even your state representatives, um, you know, about these issues and, and make it known that this is important to you, that you would like to see the protection of the public beach or, you know, um, to do sea level rise adaptation planning or things like that to make your viewpoints known does help when when um, you know elected officials are in are in tough situations to make decisions. Um, you know it's important that they hear from the community and truly hear what those perspectives are um, that can be really, really helpful. And it doesn't necessarily have to be like at the point of a public hearing. It can be, you know, email or or phone conversations ahead of time on, you know, just so that they know that these issues actually are important to their constituents. Because otherwise they don't, yeah, it's hard to make those hard decisions if you don't have the public support. So yeah, it's really important to to do that. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Anything else? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, it doesn't sound like we have any more questions coming in. So um, thank you so much, Meg, for doing this talk with us. This was really, really, uh, yeah, such, a, such an important topic to, to hear from and hear about. And, and I'm really glad that Margaret reached out to you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. It was great yeah. to have this conversation. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we hope you'll join us again in May when we have a talk about the history of wildfires on the coast. And um, until next time. Thank you. Good night. Good night.